Hey everybody, it's Jim here. It's been a little bit since the last time we've done an Audio podcast. However, I recently had a conversation with an awesome guy named John Robson. He also does YouTube and he's one hell of a teacher. I would recommend checking out his stuff. But today... We wanted to talk about what most people want to hear about, and that's gear, including Gibsons, Epiphones, Fenders, and all sorts of things in between, including why I love offset guitars. Without further ado, I hope you enjoy it, and don't forget to check out John's channel in the description. There'll be a link to it right there. Let's talk about Epiphone pricing, shall we? Sure. Okay. Do you have any idea what's going on inside the uh, the 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 kind of top floor corner office of Epiphone headquarters? Because <laughs> you know, I think that they've lost the plot. I don't think anybody knows what's going on there, and it's a weird spot because you know they are operating in a different country under different kind of leadership divisions, so it's not as transparent per se as Gibson, <laughs> but. At the same time, they're still following the price increases of Gibson. <laughs> I just never thought I'd live to see the day where there are multiple Epiphones priced right at where you can get American-made Gibsons. Exactly. Exactly. It's, um, I mean, every uh, January I do a video where I talk about uh, things I'd like to see uh, this, you know, in, in the next 12 months, you know. Um, and the past few years, I've been saying, "Come on, Epiphone, how many Joe Bonamassa guitars have you done now? Like, can, can we just have one Gary Moore uh, guitar? You know." Um, and this year, they've done it, and it's, it really is a case of be careful what you wish for, because I've looked at the guitar and I, I don't like the way it looks, and I certainly ain't paying. Well, over here, I think they're about, I might be wrong, fourteen, fifteen hundred pound for a for an Epiphone. I didn't pay that for my les- my USA made Gibson. It's only a tribute, uh, you know, bottom end, entry level um, Les Paul, but it's still a USA made Gibson, and I ain't paying half as much again for an Epiphone. It's just not going to happen. There's no way, and the problem becomes all of the import brands. If you look at them, yeah. once you get into the higher tier of yep. them. As far as the Indonesian and the Chinese specifically, the prices on those just they're they're getting out of control. And I don't feel like I don't know. The specs are good. And especially on the low end, brands like Harley Benton that have kept Mm -hmm. the prices very reasonable. Mm -hmm. I commend them because that's not the case with brands like Epiphone. And it's it becomes the more people that find out about brands like Harley Benton, the harder it's going to be. For them to be able to to try and justify these prices further. Yeah, we're going to get all the haters in the comments section now. You know that. Sure, you, certainly. You, you you mentioned the two initials, H and B, Harley Benton. Um, <laughs> all of the caps lock warriors will be out now in force. Um, I'll let them. But, I, I mean, I don't know. It depends where... Um, what people's perception of a brand is. Um, I mean... The, not my current single cut, um, but the one I had before that was a Harley Benton. Okay, uh, it was the SC five fifty two, um, and it was a beautiful looking thing, gorgeous flame top on it, stainless steel frets, you know, beautiful guitar, and I never bonded with it. Um, it was nice, I enjoyed playing it, but it was just it was never the guitar that I reached for, you know. Um, then I got um, I got a larger than expected bill from the taxman, and I thought, well, okay, I can pay it, you know. Um, but it just struck me. Well, it was about a thousand more than I was expecting to have to pay. Um, I thought, well, I can pay it, but if there's going to be a thousand pounds going out the door, I'd, I'd rather there was a big lump of money going out the door rather there was a big lump of guitar coming back in in return for it. And because of like, I play guitar for a living, you know, guitars are tax deductible. So, you know, the following year I bought the, um, this one, let me grab it. I bought the tribute and it was like nine, nine, five or nine, nine, nine or something like that. And 
The reason I bought it, well, yeah, it's a tax write-off, and you know, it's you know, but it had that name on it. I'd had a good year. I wanted to give myself a trophy, yeah. you know, and I'll fully admit that you know, you can buy a guitar that looks a lot like this for a lot less than this that sounds very much like this, um, you know. I, you know, I, I admit that that guitar is, you know, call it my midlife crisis, my trophy, whatever you want to call it. I still love it though. And it depends, I think, on whether, um, you know, the Epiphone brand can have that cachet that people are going to say, oh, Epiphone, yeah, that's, that's worth saving up for. That's worth, and I just don't think it can because it's been for decades now, um, you know, Maybe not when Epiphone, were, well, they still are, but, you know, like on, a, on an Epiphone casino or something like that, where that is an Epiphone guitar, you know? But when they started using Epiphone, the Epiphone brand on Gibson shapes, like SGs and, um, you know, and Les Pauls and stuff, um, it, it just, it's like, okay, here's the cheap one. Here's the budget one. You can't afford what you really want, so have this one instead. It's almost as good. Not quite, it's, but it's almost as good. Um, so I just don't know if Epiphone, the Epiphone brand has too much of that baggage with it to ever be an aspirational uh, kind of thing on a Les Paul or something like that. Yeah. What do you think? You said exactly what I wanted to say. Four guitars like the Sheraton, the mm -hmm. Rivera, and the Casino, mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of people who have played those historically because that's a big part of it too. You mm -hmm. can immediately think of Noel Gallagher playing yeah. that buffoon. You can think of John Lennon playing yeah. the casino. And when it comes to the Les Pauls and the SGs, who? Yeah. So I think, me, I, think I remember seeing a, um, a rock festival on TV where the guy out of Twisted Sister was playing an Epiphone Les Paul. But that's it. That's all I can think of. Yeah, I, it, it's difficult. And I know that there was one band. It might have been Cheap Trick. One of the guitarists played an Epiphone 339 on tour mm -hmm. just because if anything went wrong with it, he knew he could go to the store and just pick up another one and it wouldn't be a big deal. And it wasn't a valuable instrument as far as, you know, damages. Mm -hmm. But that's it. Yep. And, um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if, um, if, if they pull this one off. Um, I suspect, I don't know, my, my gut feeling is that, um, that they probably will get away with it because the guitars that they're putting out there, you know, you, you look around for them. They're, they're always out. I mean, when they brought out the Carina um, V and the Carina um, Explorer, you know, you try looking for one of those, sold out everywhere. So people are paying the money. Yeah, absolutely. But before I get killed in the comments for just being like, oh, it's Gibson or Harley Benton for him, let me show you one of the biggest reasons why I, I will never pay that for an Epiphone. I have a guitar I have to Go show you. Oh, yep. One second. This guitar is completely handmade in Japan. Yeah. It has an ebony board, real binding, nitro mm -hmm. finish, all CTS, hand wound pickups in it. And this thing is like an R7. It is unbelievably good. Uh -huh. It is light. It's under eight pounds. Wow. This, this cost me used, and you, you can find these. The brand mm -hmm. is called a 77 mm -hmm. for a few hundred less than what a greenie would cost and the quality of instrument it is not even close because they don't make a billion of these a year so yep. for me i would rather take my time and get something like this if if i was stuck to that price range because in the in the grand scheme of things yeah the pull of the gibson is a big thing i have a gibson 335 i've tried other brands and just something about that one i did the same thing i was like you know what that's like that's my reward guitar mm -hmm even though it might not be quantifiably better or worth the yeah. money, so to speak to some people, to me it was, and it still is. And I love that guitar, but there are so many other brands 
that are just killing it, especially in Japan. Mm -hmm. it, it, there is no way, knowing what I know about the guitar manufacturers there and the pricing, that I would ever ever purchase an Epiphone at their new pricing. It's just, it's just nuts. I tried one of the um, the, the, the 59 Les Pauls. Um, yeah. You know, I had it, I had it basically someone sent it to me uh, to do a review on, and I had the option of buying it at a very, very generous price. And I don't know, it just I couldn't, I could not find a single thing wrong with it. But I just thought, this is going to be just a guitar that is going to just sit there on the rack and, and not get played, you know. Um, it's, I don't know, it just felt a bit cold. Um, so do you, do you see, um, let's assume for, for a moment that uh, Epiphone pulled this off. Uh, do you see other, other manufacturers, um, you know, kind of... Uh, paying attention and um i guess what i'm saying is do you do you foresee that in a couple of years time we might be uh being invited to pay a four-figure price tag for a squire i don't think we're far off from that especially when you look at the trajectory of the mexican made fenders specifically mm -hmm. because you and i would both remember 10 years ago mm -hmm. $300 for one of the classic series, which is yep. the 50s or the 60s reissue, that was a common occurrence. Mm -hmm. And the equivalents now are the Ventura 2s. Mm -hmm. If you want a Strat, that's 1150 or 1200 US. Yep. And again, it comes back to what you said earlier on. I could buy a used American standard from you know that same time period of the late 2000s, early or the early 2010s. And I feel like I'm getting more for my money. I feel like I'm not kind of i don't know it's it's almost weird to say compromising or settling mm -hmm. but at the end of the day there there is a difference to some people even if it's just here and i i don't know it, it it's a strange one i think fender are on track to, to, to do that sooner than anybody else and mm -hmm. then you have paul reed smith they're taking a completely different approach um but they their SEs they already have some that are um, nine hundred and fifty dollars US. Yeah. So they'll they'll get there really quick too. Yeah, and I think I mean personally, I've had a, a like a, a bunch of uh, SEs, um, yeah. and they're nice guitars, but they're worth that. The the step up in quality from when you go from an SE to an S two, I think is just mm -hmm. absolutely quantum leap. And if you shop around for an S two, I got this one for i paid 700 pounds for this i believe it you know and it's in, in it's a 20 this is a 2016 model um they're basically the same model as they have today but the uh they have different pickups in it i think they have the 58 15s in these days and, and this is a hfs and a vintage bass that's in here they sound awesome it's got a trem that is impossible to put out of tune and it's it just kind of, it doesn't have that kind of Liberace vibe that many of the um, <laughs> yeah, that many of the higher end ones do. And for, what I'm saying is, for the same sort of money that you'd pay for a um, an SE, less in fact, uh, you can get something you, you get something like that used, and it's a far far better guitar, I think. I 100% agree with you, and. It's weird because if you look at it from the other side of the token, I know a few people that will only <laughs> purchase guitars new. Mm -hmm. And they feel the same way about the SE versus the S2. But mm -hmm. the value, I would argue, is worse with the S2 if you purchase it at the new pricing for like mm -hmm. the McCarty 594 or the Custom 2408 mm -hmm. because you're getting the same exact electronics and a lot of the same hardware in the S2 that you get in the SE anyway. Yeah. Granted, to me, mm -hmm. it, it, when you play them and you sit with them, the American ones are much better. Mm -hmm. But a thousand more dollars? Yeah. At that point, at that point, if you're going to spend two thousand dollars on a Paul Reed Smith, you can get a used core one. Yeah. It yeah. might not have the prettiest top or the fanciest new pickups or colors, mm -hmm. but it's still a core PRS, and, and, yeah. and if, that's how I would do it. And I, I also think that it's um, once you get into that sort of level of pricing, where you're kind of talking multiples of, of thousands, 
yeah. then you're probably buying it on finance anyway. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a few penny, well, a few dollars or a few pounds a month on your monthly payments. So just, you know, <laughs> just do it that way. As I say, you know, if, if you're going to be, uh, you know, spreading the cost, then break that cost down into, you know, I don't know, 24 or 36 monthly payments. How much yeah. more is it a month? You can, you know, um, so, well, you know, that's, that's interesting. Um, so talking about PRS guitars, um, you ever owned one? I've had a few. Uh, okay. I had, it's the only reason I have that display mm -hmm. is because I had a Paul Reed Smith guitar, a core McCarty that was purple and the finish was already starting to fade within mm -hmm. six months and lose the color. And I was terrified. And a buddy of mine who I actually um, went to, I don't know how what you would call it in the UK, but uh, the, before university, we call it high school here. Yeah. Yeah. He ended up being a craftsman and he lives 20 minutes away and he loves Paul Reed Smith guitars too. So he just built me that case for it. And I really, really liked the way that guitar played but I felt like I had to handle it with kid gloves and I was terrified of it. Only, and it's weird because I've had more expensive fenders than that. Mm -hmm. I've had more expensive Gibsons than that, mm -hmm. but I've never had that. Like, Oh, this, like I, I can't get a scratch on this thing. Yeah, I think it's, I think that, like, you know, we've seen so many, um, you know, rock stars over decades playing a Strat or a Les Paul or a Tully that looks a bit beat up and it wears it well. I don't like, Relic no. guitars, I, I can't see that. Well, that, that each to their own, but it's not for me. Um, but you know, a, a guitar that's uh, that, that wears its scars well, that it's earned them honestly. Um, I don't have a problem with that. When was the last time you saw a, a, a kind of plush, beautiful purple burst kind of mother of pearl and gold inlay and everything? You know, core, core PRS that's got those kind of battle scars on it. You just don't see them. You know, it's that you, they are they they're meant to look pristine. So I can I can see where you're coming from on that. It it just you know, it's not a guitar that would um, that would look good relict. Uh, that that's a point actually. Do you think Paul Reed Smith will ever do road wall or relic guitars? Yes, they're gonna do it on the Silver Sky first, and then they'll do it on that. Do you even call it a Telecaster? Oh. the new one that thing is hideous i'm sorry yeah. um but but i'm telling you those two guitars mm -hmm. they'll, they'll they'll offer those in relics sooner than later I'll, I'll bet the farm on it because mayor he played a lot of relic guitars um whether they were real relics because mm -hmm. he could afford them um or or ones that were from the factory uh -huh. he had a custom shop fender uh the black one that mm -hmm. came with half the paint off of it mm -hmm. and it sold insanely well Mm -hmm. So I, I could see Paul Reed Smith doing the same thing at some point with those. But like you said, though, something about the really flamey tops, the over the top colors, the mother mm -hmm. of pearl. I don't think that those will wear nicely no. in the same way that a Gibson will or a Fender mm -hmm. will. So I don't I don't I'm not sure about those. No, I guess um, I guess the next few decades will tell. The thing is, you know, I mean, PRS, I mean. They've been around now since the mid '80s. '85 was it that the, um, the custom PRS Custom Twenty Four Four or P what well, the first one anyway? Yeah. Uh, when that came out, um, and so they've been around long enough to kind of get those knocks, but you just never see them. You never see any any of examples of that brand or that particular range or model of guitars having had that kind of life. I guess it's because most people treat them like you do you know it's like just put it on the stand little spotlight on it you know and and um you know uh, and treat it as the sacred object that it is well it would be for me if i paid that kind of money for but um yeah. so let's talk about offsets uh, i know you love these <laughs> i don't know i mean the, the the first fender guitar i ever played was an offset um you know i <clears throat> There was a Fender Stratocaster that was on kind of permanent display in the uh, in the window of the little guitar shop in the little town where I grew up. 
and you know and you weren't allowed to touch it but you could just go and stare at it longingly you know um so and that was a big thrill to be in the same room as a real fender um and then i went to college in 84 and there was a guy who lived in the same halls of residence as me who had a real fender real fender it's a fender on the headstock it was a completely butchered and modded music master uh-huh. with um and he he chiseled and hacked um, a dimasio super distortion into the bridge and um and left that the little kind of covered single coil near the neck and uh bodged a, a pickup switch in the butt it was a real fender and um you know i, I picked it up and played it because he was kind enough to let me play it and it's like you know that, like that scene in uh, the blues brothers where the light shines down on john belushi and it's like ah, oh, you know it's that kind of moment you know i finally played one um and uh this is when i was playing I'll show you what one of these this is the same model of guitar as i had in 84. Uh, this is a satellite les paul copy uh, 80 pounds in 1980 of the finest plywood money can buy um, with fake humbuckers uh, single nasty cheap scratchy sounding ceramic single coils inside fake humbucker covers and if i remember rightly the covers when you kind of looked inside them uh there's still you could still see the faint uh, ghost of pepsi logos on there so they were making the pickup covers out of old pepsi cans um, so to have one of those you know <clears throat> uh, and uh, and and play a real fender that was a, a big thrill um <clears throat> but i don't know it was just i didn't know i knew the square root of nothing about guitars back then <clears throat> some would argue that's still the case um but you know i i i started kind of looking at pictures of guitar getting guitar magazines and you know and i know just something about the shape of, of an offset it's just the, the way the it's like the, the kind of lower horn wants to come out further but it just kind of got stopped in its tracks That's a, i'm not making much sense but I, you know the shape of them i don't find aesthetically pleasing um is that something that ever troubled you when you got past it or is it is it something that um you you like the the look of them i know when we spoke before you uh, you said it's the vibrato that uh, really sells it to you um so tell me why you love offset guitars then they feel right okay when, when i sit with them i don't know it just it's it, it just feels right in my lap mm -hmm. whether it's the jaguar more so than the jazz master okay because of, because of the scale length on it i feel like it's it's much more compact it's like mm -hmm. a little bit bigger um than a telecaster mm -hmm. sitting with it but it gives me stuff that a telecaster just it just doesn't give me and I, I, I primarily play rhythm like most guitarists do, and they don't want mm -hmm. to admit 99% yep. of the time. And for me, that comfort with the vibrato there and being able mm -hmm. to be so expressive with it has always worked. Mm -hmm. And I never was a huge sustain monster. So that never really got to me until later in life. Mm -hmm. But offset guitars, they don't have that. They have, you know, a, a quick attack to them, but... Mm -hmm. They they sound amazing for the styles of music that I want to play. And when I was out playing in California for over a decade, uh, right on the coast, there's always an offset. And it was just, it just works. It just sounded good. You didn't need anything but the amp. You didn't need 50 freaking pedals or any sort of switching. You just plugged into a nice amp with a good spring reverb and you were good to go. Yeah. When I think of uh, of a typical Fender offset sound, <clears throat> The thing that immediately pops into my head is uh, the intro to Surfing USA. You know, yeah. just that kind of that sort of <clears throat> bright, clean, um, as you say, sharp attack and no sustain. Do you ever find that? Um, what, what, what's the one with the big pickups? That's a jazz master, isn't it? Jazz master, yeah. yeah. Um, do you ever find you have noise problems with those? Because that's when I played. I did a. Um, <clears throat> A review of a jazz master a couple of years ago and it was a noisy beast 
It was like really kind of just, just any kind of um, stray electronic noise, it would find its way into, into that. I had to have really kind of play with a noise gate to get that guitar sounding good. I don't have problems with that. Uh, the majority of jazz masters I get are from Japan, and they do an excellent job of shielding underneath. So I, I just don't have those issues. And then I have a gold American vintage 65 yeah. reissue that I've had that for over a decade at this point. And the same thing, Fender USA at that time, that was when I believe they were making their best guitars of the, mm -hmm. of this last like 30 years was, mm -hmm. was that line of guitars. No problems whatsoever with those. However, I will say to your experience, I have played um, both Squire and Mexican jazz masters that the second you plugged it in, it was all hell broke loose and they were brand new guitars. Yeah. Like I was like, Oh, I'm like somebody didn't wire this right. Or somebody did not shield this right. And mm -hmm. it is what it is. I, I, I'm talking about brand new fenders. I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, I think you know where I'm going with this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what's with the fret sprout? You know, it's all oh, it's environmental conditions, nothing to do with us. You know, that's, that, you know, well, A, I can buy a guitar that costs a fraction of what you're charging that doesn't seem to suffer from the same environmental conditions. And B, your guitars didn't suffer from these conditions 20 years ago. You know, um, it just, I've got a, a Nashville Telecaster on the wall back there. Yeah. Uh, which is very, very, very generously given to me as a gift. Uh, but that needed um, a little bit of remedying when it turned up. And when you looked at it through a magnifying glass, it was just like this simply hadn't given any treatment to the fret ends at all. No. It was just like snip them off square, send it out, you know. Um, so I don't know. It's it's For me, it's starting to get a little bit like, like it was in the late 70s. Um, when you got the sense that Fender just didn't care. Stick our brand on it, stick our logo on it, it'll sell because it says Fender. And then Bill Schultz kind of, when he did led the management buyout, that was, um, you know, you, things improved because they had to. Um, and I don't know, I just think it's kind of getting a little bit back to where it was back in the late 70s again, um, in terms of the, it's, you, not on all guitars, but on a, on a lot of them that I played lately, you, you just get the feeling this wasn't built by somebody who, who gave a damn, you know? I agree. And it's really unfortunate. I love Fender guitars more than any other brand. And I often get called a Fender hater because I'm the most critical of them. Mm -hmm. I've had a few American vintage from this line for, for demo stuff and for buy and resell and that kind of thing. And they were both fine. The te actually, the Telecaster was fine. The mm -hmm. the surf green one, the fretwork was okay. It was passable, but again, you're talking about a twenty two hundred dollar guitar, twenty one hundred dollars, and it it didn't feel like a guitar that was special or that they took extra time to really set up nicely. The Jazzmaster, mm -hmm. they did not test the rhythm circuit. It didn't function. And the fretwork on that was awful. And that's a $2,500 guitar. Uh, you see, there's no excuse for that. It's just... awful. Yeah. Awful. I, there's no other way of saying it. I was, I was so disappointed. And it's sad because I wanted to really love that guitar. And a year before that, you probably don't follow the offsets enough to remember, they did the 60th anniversary Jaguar. Mm -hmm. And it was in my favorite color of Lake Placid Blue, but it was a bit fancier. I ordered one sight unseen because I was just like, I love Jaguars and I don't think they're going to make one like this. Mm -hmm. That was the worst new Fender guitar outside of, you know, really cheap Squires that I, that I can ever recall playing. Every It was just an entire botch job. The, okay. the, the frets weren't even close to level. They were not finished. The guitar just played like a dog. It weighed like an anchor. And it did nothing for me. I tried to, even on YouTube, to give it the benefit of the doubt, like it'll grow on me. Mm -hmm. it, no, you sometimes there's just, it's just not there at all. So w would you class that as, because this is, it's almost like we planned this. Um, 
Oh, next thing I was going to say to you, um, is that um, like your biggest di- disappointment, your biggest case of buyer's remorse? Would, would it be that guitar or is the one that ranks even higher? <coughs> the disappointment would be that one. Okay. A hundred percent, because that was the one that I weighed. I had a 50th anniversary Jaguar <coughs> and then life happens. Mm-hmm. I, I had to sell it to fund a move back to California. And I said, if they ever make a 60th, mm-hmm. I'll wait and I'll get it. And then sure enough, they did. And that guitar just sucked. It just, it was not a good guitar. And again, $2,500 mm-hmm. and I've never been that disappointed in an instrument. Fire remorse wise, yeah. though, that's a yeah. different question. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if I would say it's full on remorse, but if I if there was one, it was the PRS, the core PRS, because I don't like feel and it wasn't even the guitar's fault, mm-hmm. but that mental stigma of. I, I didn't want to to damage it. I didn't want it to get like scratches. I I'm normally I don't care about that. I have guitars out on the racks. I've gigged guitars that are, you know, expensive American guitars. I don't care. But with that specific guitar, I feel like I never got the most out of it because of whatever reason that I, I wasn't willing to, to treat it the same way. And then when I went to sell it, every single little scratch or a little missed thing was scrutinized by everybody who was in the market to buy it. It was a terrible experience and I doubt I'll ever go down that route again. It's interesting because I think probably my biggest, a guitar that I'd really kind of, ever since they came out, I'd looked at it and thought, that's got my name written all over it. You know, um, I love a vintage voiced bridge humbucker. I like a guitar with a fixed bridge. I like a big, fat neck single coil. And, you know, I had enough money burning a hole in my pocket, so I pulled the trigger on a PRS Vela guitar. Huh. Uh, I know, offset, but not... Okay. It's, I'm it, 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 it's not offset, offset. It doesn't kind of... It, anyway, and... You know, getting out of the box. Oh my god, it looked gorgeous in person. I managed to get one that had the um, had the dot inlays because I don't like the PRS birds. Um, you know, and it was just balances nicely. I plugged it in, and it just sounded thin. No matter what I did with it, it just sounded like I'm, you, this big fat neck single coil pickup that just sounded like so underpowered and lacking in bass and just nothing I did with it. And, and, the, and the bridge humbucker was just, just, I mean, I'm, I'm no fan of like, you know, screaming demon or, you know, kind of um, super, super distortion pickups or anything like that. I just, but it just sounded so weak and underpowered and, and just, I, I, wanted so much to love that guitar but it was sold within a week and it was the uh, the s the, the s2 standard that um that came as a replacement but um you know that I, well you know i, I kind of turned it over and, and and put the money back into the um into the s2 I actually made a little bit of a uh, little bit of a profit on that whole kind of one out one in kind of thing um but yeah, that would probably be my um, biggest disappointment because it was like, okay, so you, you've got a guitar that you know isn't really for you. But I, you know, I've been looking at these for about five years. These Vela guitars, thinking, got to get me one of those. It's gonna be, it's gonna be fantastic, you know. And it just, it just didn't float my boat. It just felt great to play, but just so I could have. Well, I could have upgraded the humbucker, but finding a replacement for that for that uh, neck pickup might have been um, a bit of a tall order because it's like a one-off bespoke yeah. pickup, isn't it? You know, it's not like the standard size. Um, okay, Jim, um, I got to wrap it up there because um, I got a lesson to do in in fifteen minutes or so, well, less than that now, and uh, then I got an appointment with Mister Heineken. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, <laughs> um, so uh, I can't keep him waiting. 
No, oh, he's important. <laughs> Thank you once again for, you know, just uh, being a good sport and joining in with me on this and helping me out while, um, you know, I'm out with a splint now. Um, I see but, that. Uh, here's the problem. Take a look at the, the third finger. Okay, we're, we're looking good. We're looking good. Then, and there's the angle that I can't get past. You know, How much longer do you think? Um, beginning of March is is going to be when the um, the the outcomes are going to be either that's permanent in um, or it isn't. If it isn't, and you know, I get the movement back, fine. You know, great. I'll uh, I'll settle for that. Um, but if that's not the case, then it's either more surgery or I just learn to kind of play around. I just kind of go full on Django. Well, not quite full on because he only had these two. I've got this one as well. Um, and, and just see what happens. You know, I've been doing a little bit of playing with it um, already. And I think I'm going to have to rethink string gauges uh, because, you know, if I'm doing bends with this finger and this finger now um, rather than bending with that one. It's uh, a set of 10 to 46s is um, just a little bit uh, a little bit too strenuous. No problem playing with nines, but yeah. yeah, I hope it heals and you know, I'll be in touch and we'll see how things go as far as the healing. Hope it yeah. ends up good for you. Yeah, either it will or it won't. And it's, you know, I, I, I beat cancer a couple of years ago, so a busted finger in there can stop me. Oh, better not. <laughs> Okay, Jim, uh, I've got to shoot off. Uh, thank you so much once again. And uh, just as I say, when you've got that, um, that bat out hell shit ready, just ping it over to me, Dropbox it, whatever. And uh, I will give you a massive, massive shout out in the um, <clears throat> in the video. Once this, uh, once I'll Dropbox this video, ping it over to you. You can chop it up, do what you want with it to, um, you know, to kind of use on your channel. Um, got it. And uh, no doubt we'll be in touch again soon. All right. Thanks, John. Have a good rest of your day. Take it easy. And you, Jim. Take care now. Bye-bye.